So we're going to do two uh, sponsor um, spotlights very quickly and then get to our fourth panel. The first sponsor spotlight will be Rye Sanderson from Parknell. Rye? Thank you. So it's uh, good to see everyone in here. It looks like I am about half the age of everyone. Either that or we've all really aged. Um, so to me, parking makes absolutely almost no sense. Um, we come from an industry where you have the airlines and now hotels um, using dynamic pricing. And parking, unfortunately, hasn't entered that realm quite yet. We've made great strides in getting there um, with our on-street demand pricing like SF Park and these great pilots. Unfortunately, at the parking level, for those of you who operate and run parking equipment or parking facilities, it's not quite the same. We have uh, what we call a flat rate, which is our dynamic pricing. Uh, so we have a guy running out there, changing the rate on the fly, and unfortunately, it's usually, usually your lowest paid employee changing your rate. Um, so you have all these other industries, they're using advanced analytics, and they have their highest paid employees changing their rate, airlines, hotel. Um, so parking's behind, and we need to catch up. So I think what, what we do at Park Now is off-street dynamic yield pricing um, for reservations. So we have a platform where we upload rates the operators provide uh, into our system and then push those to the consumer through an app or um, a website. So our consumers are able to see transparency about rates as well as make reservations in advance for planning. Um, and one of the really interesting facts that came out of some of our data and some of our pilots is people are starting to, to shift. Um, they're using airlines, they're using hotel reservation platforms, and now they're starting to use parking. We see about, on average, people are booking 11 hours in advance um, for their parking events, which is something that you only used to see in airlines bookings. So it's really a, a become a shift, and we're hopefully we're able to drive it and move uh, parking into the 21st century. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. If you have any further questions, I'll be in the lobby. All right, and then I'd, um, I'd like to invite uh, Richard Jaffe from um, uh, Park Assist up. Richard? Hey guys, so very simple. Uh, we believe that parking should be not just stress-free from a customer perspective, but should be very efficient. Uh, efficient when it comes to asset owners and efficient when it comes to the operation of those sites. And you know, when we were looking at how to do that, we started to look actually at other industries. So we looked within not just the garage attached to the shopping mall, we looked in the shopping mall. You know, we didn't look at parking within the airport, we looked within the airport and we said, you know, where is technology going? And what we found most interesting was that if you look in your phone, if you look in the Xbox that your kids will use, or if you look at your car, um, everything has moved towards an imaging platform, right? So a lot of the simpler sensors, whether they're magnetic or infrared, a lot of that stuff has kind of gone by the wayside. And consumer components now are getting picked up with imaging. And it means costs are coming down. It means you have a much richer data set that you can do things with. And so we started playing with imaging, and we launched the first imaging network uh, three years ago, and we were able to actually detect in real time uh, every single space within a garage. And what's kind of neat about this is that you have now all this information. You have not just is a car there, but you have the license plate. You know if there's movements. You could even really detect a, uh, a symbol, for example, you know, to BMW instead of an Audi, right? You can, you can start to think about all the different things you can do if you have that kind of rich data. And we believe that the future of parking is very much about using this data and unlocking a lot of very specific use cases depending on the type of parking garage you own. And so we started to install these systems three years ago. Uh, it took us three or four years before to work on that technically. And we've started to see rapid adoption around the world. Uh, the U.S. is a little slower than other countries, unfortunately, but we're getting there. And we've gone from one to 15 countries, just to give you a sense, in the last two and a half years. So we've started to see a lot of adoption. <coughs> And I think what's, what's most interesting is some of the ways that you can improve both operations and the user experience. You can do things like find your car. You can do things like charging different rates for different spaces. And, you know, that was mentioned a few minutes ago. And I think that this is really the way that the future is going. Um, so at Park Assist, we're working a lot with both the private and the public sector now uh, to find other people that share our vision. Um, and it's a very exciting time for us. So if you have any questions, I'll be out uh, outside as well. And I would love to chat with anyone who's interested.
Thank you. This is the red meat se session, the one I look most forward to. So we've, we've looked at, at really some practical applications that have happened in San Francisco and in L.A., and um, we've heard about what's worked and what hasn't worked. And we're gonna, the next section is really going to be about where technology is going, um, where innovation is going, and, and what's really happening. And so this is going to focus on the challenges that cities and operators and drivers uh, are facing and that they can make to make uh, smarter parking um, work across the board. Um, and it'll look at a variety of drivers and a variety of technologies. Our moderator for this session is Kirk uh, Beschler, who's the Vice President of Business Development and the General Manager of Park Edge, which is, as you heard before, a street line company. Quick, Kirk. Here's how we're gonna do this. We're going to have an interesting panel of some questions. Every 15 minutes, you will vote one of the members of the panel off. <laughs> By the end of the session, we will be able to announce, this is your American parking idol. <laughs> so, no, we're not really going to do that. Um, but what we are going to do, I'm going to give a few introduction, introductory comments, and then we're going to just go to in interesting questions. I hope they're interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll go through those for about an hour, and then we'll open it up to questions, and off we'll go. All right? So I'll do some introductions in a moment. So I want to talk to you about, I've been a part of nine, I've either joined or started personally nine companies in my life. Um, had some spectacular wins and some real craters. So it is part of the portfolio. But one thing that I've always driven is an ecosystem, an ecosystem of partners who can really do things together. We, we are better together. It does take uh, sort of a village. And I look at this and say, if we really tra trace history, the phone industry, your, your bagel shop in 100 years ago in New York City needed seven phones on the wall to talk to everyone. It was just aggregated, fractured systems, yet they integrated cooperated and the, the industry prospered. My mom, uh, maybe your parents as well, had one picture of me in their wallet and they had a zigzag of proprietary credit cards. And yet, I, I'm sure that there was a, a chief revenue officer at Sears said, no way am I cooperating with other people. I want to own this customer. But and eventually they did. They cooperated. We have a couple of credit cards in our wallet typically and more business is done. This industry grew. In the same way, if we look at office or if we look at Expedia, travel, all these industries, they started fragmented, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but integration, cooperation actually ended up making the business bigger. If we look at now the, the transportation, uh, transportation society or, or world, uh, cars have made tremendous progress, tremendous progress on navigation, on safety. Let's look at each one of these. Safety. We started, we added ABS and anti-swerve and all these great things. If we look at navigation, it started with a map, but then it eventually went to Never Lost, and then eventually went to other in-dash and portable systems. And ultimately, traffic. Started with a helicopter over KGO's helicopter, whatever it might be, your local radio station. But eventually became fleet, and then even, uh, even the end user is involved in chasing down these, this data and bringing this data forward so you can commute better. So how are we doing in parking? Well, I'd say... <laughs> Here's the proof. Here's the proof. Hasn't changed much in the last 60, 70 years. And this is true off-street and on-street for the most part, right? So we can make a lot of progress, a uh, lot of smart people, but there's a lot of fragmentation. But meanwhile, the technology, while all these other industries have been integrating and, and cooperating and making progress, the technology to support that has been developed. And the parking industry has a bigger delta, but that means a faster change is possible. So we can see a lot of innovation that can happen in the next coming years. So... Um, my this didn't save properly, so um, it didn't save. I'm going to skip around. I want to get to my introductions. These slides were uh, reordered, and then the system crashed, so it didn't save the changes. So let's get into this. Um, as mentioned, my, my name is Kirk Beekler, uh, and I'm a VP of BizDev at Streetline. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, I've started a number of companies, but I got very excited about parking because it's all about data. And I've been a data hound for a lot of companies in a lot of years. Uh, we're joined. First, I'll do some introductions. Stephen Belton. Stephen is uh, director, uh, uh, director of Sales and Marketing at California Parking, so we have one operator here. We also have Stephen Douglas, second. So we're going to st have an opportunity to hear from the industry what they think about technology. But we also have Eugene Cirklevich. Did I say that right? Okay. Yeah, we'll, call, we'll all call easier. him Eugene. So. Uh, and then Rich Joffe. 
who you just heard from. Unfortunately, Joe Savants was caught in uh, weather uh, out of uh, his airport. So the bad news is we don't get his opinions. The good news is we do have somebody to throw under the bus for all issues. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to have to skip around, unfortunately, I see. But first thing I want to get to, if I can find it, um, well, we'll go here first. So um, I want to go to the parking industry first and look at this and say State of the Union. State of the Union, what's going right, what's going wrong in terms of technology, your relationship with customers, uh, you know, what, how you're optimizing your business. Let's start with what the, the positive. What is going right in the last you know, two or three years in terms of what you've developed? Stephen Douglas, you want to start? Or? I'll start, sure. So uh, what's going right? Uh, so technology has been, it's really been great, right? I mean, uh, when it works... You uh, can increase revenue, you decrease potential for theft, you get the money in the bank faster. It's very efficient for the customer. Uh, the operators have terrific reports to look at that they never uh, used to get to look at. Um, so when it's, when it's going great, it, it's really fabulous. Uh, customers can make reservations, they can find parking in advance online. Um, and and we've, really, we've really been able to use technology to our advantage the last couple of years to uh, fill unused parking spaces and to, to get money to the bank faster and to do all these great things that you hear about that the, part, that the, right. that the uh, vendors uh, uh, have, have acknowledged. I have some other sides too. but Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I would agree in, in certain sectors we've had lots of successes. Uh, um, event parking, uh, and I agree completely with Stephen. The reporting, having the money in the bank, I know the city of San Francisco enjoys that. Um, with their parking tax, and, and, and any city that has parking tax. Uh, the money's there. There's no issues with theft. And uh, you can control an inventory. So if you want to allow more, you can get more. And uh, that's working. It seems to be a sociological change that people realize that if they want to go to the Giants game, they need to buy parking ahead of time. Uh, what's not working or what's not really happening uh, the lack of knowledge that the people have, the customers have, of mm -hmm. the technology in general, and then also uh, transient parking. That every day I'm going downtown to park. Uh, there is no need at this point for booking at this yet, uh, at least overall. We have uh, onesies and twosies, and some of these great companies that are here uh, are a testament to that, and that's, I think, the challenge, is how to teach the people that they can do everything online with a specific message. Who's our customer? Where are they coming from? And what do they really need or get by booking these reservations online? Yeah. How about you, Stephen? Yeah, well, I, uh, I agree. Again, the, the technology is great when it works, but we've, uh, uh, after all these years of trying to pride ourselves on our industry and ourselves on giving the best customer service possible, we can still do that when the equipment is working. But we can't do it when the equipment is not working. What, what we've all sort of done over the years now is we've put in uh, you know, pay by phone and pay by space, all these great features, but when it's not working, you lose revenue for, for various reasons. And when the customers don't read the signs well or they don't understand the signage or they don't understand the directions <laughs> or they just simply don't want to follow the directions and it doesn't work, now you've got customer service issues because we've not only installed great equipment, but we've now reduced the number of staff hours in the garage mm -hmm. to balance out that cost. And now there's no one to yell at or no one to talk to or no one to ask a question. And that's been, that's been our struggle is finding a balance between putting in this great equipment either on site or remotely and also continuing to provide great customer service. And, I, and that's been our challenge that I think that we need to take to the next step. Yeah, right hand not talking to the left hand. Uh, Oh, I paid, but now I still got a parking citation yeah. because I didn't leave this or this machine didn't talk to this machine, and now they've actually got to waste more time by calling us, and we're trying to figure this out. So um, integration with the different technologies, because there's pay by phone or pay by reservations or pay on your app or pay on your phone or uh, search for it on the phone, but then you have to still print it up because it's a non-attended lot, and I don't have anywhere to print because I just booked it on my phone, those kinds of things. So I'm hearing a couple things. One, one, one of uh, reliability, early stages of technology, when they break, they break badly. They, they break hard. And two is integration. Uh, systems are not interconnected. Is that fair? 
Well, I don't necessarily think they break. I, I, I actually think that he, it's better now because now when something goes down, they can fix something remotely. For, for me, the problem, when I, when I say equipment doesn't work, it's usually the user who has made, caused the equipment not to work. Right. And that's, and that's okay. my issue is, is they don't read the signs, they don't follow directions, whatever it is, whatever they don't do, okay. then the equipment in their eyes is broken. It's not, it doesn't work, it's broken. And then you've got to fix it. Right. But at least when the equipment really does break, whatever that means, right. it usually can be fixed remotely these days, which is great. Right. The problem is when I, when I refer to broken equipment, I refer to an, a user not being able to use the equipment correctly. Well, and then right back to customer service, it doesn't become the vendor's issue. It becomes the operator's yeah. issue. Yeah. Much like any other vendor working at any other cus you know, a company, they don't look, they're not going to call the vendor. They're calling right. us. And sometimes there's a lack of communication between the actual <laughs> users and the, the guys at the garage uh, those situations. So, there seems to be a huge learning curve here in the United States on how to use automated equipment that they don't seem to have. <laughs> right. you know, anywhere else. Learning curve, or is it just not easy enough? Is it not bulletproof UI? It's you pretty know? easy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, and, and with that same idea, though, I think it's just. I mean, I have I have these same arguments and debates in my own office. It's right. an old school industry, you know. I mean, heck. Ten years ago, we, I'd say half of our parking lots still had the, you know, you stuff the dollar bills and, you yeah. know, with your piece of metal. We, we just moved into credit card machines in the last ten years at lots. So, and now we're all of a sudden, you don't need any money. You just need to bring a piece of paper with your name and your car on it. Here you go. Or I'll leave it in the window. There. It's, it's something completely new. So if I made one observation, I'd say we, we touched a nerve. <laughs> Um, <laughs> 10% of, of, the, of the response was, uh, what's going right? <laughs> um, uh, so, but let's think about that. Uh, you know, Eugene, uh, one of the, th the things that was, was mentioned was people don't know, don't have information. You, you're, you're trying to attack that. Why don't you think, let's think about what's going right, as you see, the technology industry and how it can embrace and, and, help, and help out. Okay, so, so um, thanks, Kurt. So my name is Eugene Serkovich, and I work for Parkipedia. And what we do is we provide parking services to the automotive industry. So we allow drivers inside cars to find that parking. In the future, I'm sure they'll be able to pay and reserve that parking. So I, so I kind of span both the parking industry and the automotive industry. And, and really, if there is, you know, one thing I want to do is kind of explain to the parking, the majority of you guys are in the parking industry, explain to you what is the expectations from the automotive industry. Because let me tell you that automotive industry expectations are here, and what the parking industry can deliver, especially in this country, is about here. So there is a massive gap between what the car guys are expecting to, to deliver that premium experience and what we can actually deliver because of the existing infrastructure that's in place. The massive fragmentation and just lack of any type of automation uh, and so on, everything we talked about. Coming back to your question, Kurt, about information, um, it is an interesting topic, and you know, I think LA Express Park and uh, SF Park guys have touched upon it and showed that the information is there. But I do have, and I, I do have concerns about how is it that people actually find out about that, those rates. And, and yes, the information is available online, and yes, information is available on a mobile phone. However, how many people actually look online about the street parking rates before they go out? I would say none. And how many people actually use a mobile phone? Well, it doesn't matter how many because it's actually illegal, right? So, so whereas before you might say, well, people will just drive around doing this. That's now illegal. So people now actually do that. And, um, and it's still illegal. Now, <laughs> but it's true. You know, you know you've done it. I mean, that's exactly what I do, you know. I'm not looking. And... and, and um, the, the, so, so we are trying to change that, at least when it comes to, to premium car manufacturers who do have the systems, who do have the, now the embedded connectivity inside the cars, and they can, pro can provide additional services, be it live parking, live gas prices, live traffic, whatever it is. So, so someone needs to do that. I mean, um, you know, the, 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 the likes of the car manufacturers are not really interested in building these services themselves. So, so they look to industry partners to do that for them. And that's really the value that, that, that we bring. However, we can only do that much. You're not, we're not magicians. And we can only leverage the infrastructure that you guys have in place for managing your rates, for managing your ability, and everything else. You know, yes, we can do things uh, in terms of uh, uh, tr um, instead of you know using sensors for real-time mobility, using other means. I think Jade touched upon upon transaction zone, but none of it is, is is bulletproof. And so, what's in terms of what's going right? In terms of what's going right between the parking, or, you know, having the parking at automotive industry inside. What's going right is the understanding that this is 
you know, the 1937 and 2007 still the same thing. There's an understanding now this something has, has got to change. There are better tools of doing this. So there's a general understanding that this is kind of broken. So, so we've done the first step. However, this is really just, just the first step. And we are now not, not, not anywhere close to where we need to be. You know, we have a relationship with all the largest operators. No disrespect to the largest operators in the room. Um, and, you know, the, the systems that they have to imagine, is, is, especially in this country, are relatively rudimentary. You know, they themselves don't necessarily know what the rates are, what the availability is in a given garage. I mean, um, so in other parts of the world, it's slightly better. If you go to Germany, if you go to Netherlands, you know, they are fully automated. You know, this whole guy sitting in the booth collecting cash, people just don't, you know, people have never seen that. Um, it is fully automated. So it can be done. It can be done. And, and the good thing is, like, again, just to finish this off, what's going right is there's understanding, at least in this room, and you know, we are in San Francisco, and uh, it, is, it is more advanced than the rest, but there is an understanding that there is something has got to change, something has to improve, and more importantly, those changes are actually good for the business. We're not just changing for the technology's sake. We're changing because we do think we can leverage the technology to improve the customer experience, to grow our revenue, and so on. So that's what's going right. Now, are we there yet? Not even close, but at least we're starting to move in the right track. I mean, if I think about, uh, I, again, I, I, when I was a very young man, I, I saw word processing switch over to PCs, and that led to standards, and that standard led to a, a, a one-tenth or a price, or a, I guess a order of magnitude reduction in the price. $50,000 systems went to $5,000. And then it took the next 30 years for those computers to drop from 5,000, based on volume and commoditization, to 500, right? So it took a long time based on volume and scale. But the, the, the setting of standards brought forth a precipitous drop in the cost of these, this, these kinds of equipment. As you think about this, you know, maybe, Rich, you want to offer some, some thoughts on what either how you want to respond to the parking industry itself and also what, what your thoughts are on what's going right, what's going wrong. I'll, I'll ride the fine line between making enemies and being, in, uh, <laughs> being insightful. Um, so I think what's going right is, is that within the parking industry, I think there's a greater awareness now um, about the pain points. And, you know, Eugene, I think, said it quite eloqu eloquently. But um, people understand how much money is being left on the table. They understand how inefficient this is versus, you know, it could be other countries or other ways, other cities to do this. Um, so I think there's certainly a greater awareness within the industry in terms of the, the pain points. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, smart money that's coming into the industry now. If you look at venture capital dollars, and I mean, Eugene and myself are VC-backed. I know Streetline is. A lot of guys in this room are. Um, so I think that those are all good things. And, and I think I have, I mean, I have a lot of faith, I guess, in the private sector. I think that if you have a lot of smart money and a lot of smart people thinking about it, um, Ultimately, that shakes out and you figure it out. You know, it takes a few years to figure out how that uh, platform solidifies, but I think you get there. You know, I don't think we'll be sitting here in 10 years saying, you know, I still don't know where there's, how many spaces are in a garage in the area. I, think, I mean, that problem will be solved. And so, you know, how do you do that? What's the right technology? You know, I, I think the free hand, the free market will kind of figure that out. I'm less concerned with that. Um, where do I think some of the big issues are? I think there's a huge issue in integration. So I think there's still this view of the world, and clearly Apple and Microsoft have different views of the world, and, and they both are, you know, are amazing companies. So you, know, you can win either way, but I think in parking it's dangerous because you don't have a lot of data on the cloud. So you don't have the luxury of saying both of those are realistic, right? What you have is a situation that you have a lot of dumb equipment that was put in 5, 10, 20 years ago, um, not really doing much and spinning out much information. So the question becomes, how do you integrate? And I think the onus of responsibility lies either on the, uh, a lot of the equipment manufacturers you know, to kind of be more open about that, or it lies on the, f you know, on, on the hands of the folks who are running assets, public sector in particular, um, to force that on manufacturers and say, look, you know, we appreciate that you want your um, corner of the world, but unless you provide us this data, we ain't going to buy from you again. And I think until that data starts to become more prolific uh, with open APIs where anyone, you know, if Eugene wins, fine, Eugene wins. If someone else wins, Streetline, fine. But I think at the end of the day, that data has to be out there um, such that it can be available. And I think as long as we're kind of hoarding that and saying, no, 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 I'm afraid of being whatever, from audited to, you know, looked at, you know, whatever that is, right, whatever is driving that decision, um, for opaqueness, I, I don't think that, that makes sense in the scheme of things. So I think that there has to be more pressure put on a lot of the vendors of equipment, and I speak as a vendor, right, making sure that that data is out there and available. Um, 
one of the other things that I, I think he's lacking is, you know, I kind of look at parking from a, a little bit of a higher perspective sometimes in terms of the size of the industry. You know, it's, it's $25 billion. And, you know, what L.A. and San Francisco and, and a bunch of other cities are doing is amazing. Uh, I have the greatest respect for early adopters. But it's a $25 billion industry, you know, and we're fighting over crumbs, right? We're fighting over how amazing it is that, you know, Seattle spent a few million dollars on a city guidance system. Like, it's a few million, you know what I mean? Like, let's get a grip. And this is a $25 billion industry that should be worth 50 or 100 if this is done properly. And so, you know, billions of dollars are being left on the table, right? Um, people's lives, whether it's X hundred hours per year wasted, right, driving around, um, it just doesn't work properly. And I think, you know, the tobacco industry, right, has folks in D.C. pushing for things. I mean, there needs to be a greater overarching perspective um, on how we start getting infrastructure running instead of leaving this to individual counties and asset owners, private asset owners, to actually make this happen. And so I think there needs to be more effort on all of us to actually put together that pressure, um, you know, at a federal and a state level to start getting on with the show and stop congratulating each other on what I think is a thousandth of one percent of what should be done. Right. And could I just add to that? It, just to put that into perspective, um, you might have, if you've been to Seattle, or one or two, maybe three cities in North America, you would have seen the parking guided system you're seeing here. Mm. If you go to Germany, it's in every single city, right. period. We can provide availability information in every single city in Germany. So just to give you perspective in terms of, kind of what some of the other countries are. Um, and without sending two bitter notes, I realized that I, I sounded bitter in the beginning. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm the one in the office that's totally for the technology. And, and there's people in this room that know that. Um, I mean, I can't even tell you how much our data or, or how much revenue grew with online purchases and technology because we had none last year. I mean, I, I, I got there 14 months ago. We just started working with a pilot you know, some pilot programs. We, you know, are now working with seven or eight different technology partners. And this isn't even equipment aspect. This is just online technology, phone technology, uh, and then the integration with the equipment companies. So we've seen increased revenue. We would definitely have less money in the bank if we didn't use these. Right along with what you're saying, the cooperation has to come in realizing that everyone would make more money. And to me, $25 billion just seemed that just, there's so much money being left on the table, so much. And that you want to tell everyone about this. And the people that are using the technology now are the ones that need to help spread the word. But I think it comes back again with the old industry versus the new type of industry direction because... I think parking companies are very, uh, it's all my information. I'm not going to give up anything. And you need to open those doors, the, 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 the owners and the operators, but also the vendors need to do that as well. Because I have this question with each company is, how are you marketing to get new people? You know, the tech-savvy people, sure, that's a small niche, though. Uh, you get that small group of people that keep booking and that's great but we want to you know we don't want to see onesies and twosies at the operating level we want to see new customers coming versus current customers that now learn that you could pay or book online we want to get new revenue and how do you entice those people because i think you're going to get the government at every level to help when it's the people not the industry that's wanting it, because I think there's just always that, oh, we want to make more money. No, how about making life easier for people so they don't waste time driving around? And so that's where the collaboration, I think, needs to come in with all the vendors and the operators themselves. There's a brand new way of parking, and this is how you do it. You can choose how you do it, just like you can go to Travelocity, Orbitz, Expedia, Kayak, or you can go to Southwest, and Southwest is a very interesting... Well, it, they're, they're interesting because they've never played the game in that industry, and they've survived. Um, but there was a lot of talk that they were going to move away and, and do other things. And even now, you can see certain things. They're going into the kayak, may not directly give rates, but they're telling... You can still check. They're doing advertising on kayak through Google, you know, to go to your website. So it's almost the same thing. It's just... 
people don't realize it. So, I mean, they all work together, and it benefits the whole industry. And I think when we get the whole industry working together, then there'll be more money from the governments at the local level and the federal level. Um, well, but the, the choice that I'm given as a, as a parking person is something like this, right? The old parking, the traditional parking, the, the gestalt of it is I go to my destination, then I start the second process, which is circling around, looking because I have no information. And, you know, Stephen, to your point, there's an opportunity to say, if I really know what, inform what was my best parking choice, I may say, I know it's to the left, I know it's to the right. I know it's actually before I even get to my destination, I quickly park, pull over, park, and, and go on to my destination. Um, part of this is actually because of this, this fragmentation that you guys are referring to. On the right-hand side, we have thousands of parking companies. And there's not a lot of cooperation between them uh, overall. And on the left side, we have all the consumption, the phones, we have cars, we have a, a variety of other devices. And again, not many standards, even within e any one of those vendors, they'll be incompatible. Then across those vendors, the compatibility. Now, we in the center, the technology industry has leaped into the, his to the, to the solution of confusing everyone by delivering a bunch of platforms and saying, let's, let's take an X and Y of permutations and say X, Y, and Z. And let's make it really confusing. So everyone's testing with somebody, but there really are no standards being set. So I think that's, you know, what are your thoughts on, uh, let's start with, again, go to the parking industry. What, if we think about these, these I, sorry, again, for the misorder of these, it uh, didn't get saved right, but if you think about the, the silos, what are you willing to do in collaboration, Stephen and Stephen, um, in terms of partnering with your, your, your own selves, your, your own industry, much less the technology industry? Would you participate in collaborating, in, in cooperating, so, so consumers could find that parking? It's a hard question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, think it, I, yeah. I think it's just like any other industry. Now, I've got 20 years of revenue management and operations in the hotel industry, so that's where my background is. I did valet parking for like 10 years, uh, just working on the field. So, you know, in a hotel, you've got 10 hotels within a quarter mile. They're not going to give all their information, especially what's on the books, what's going to happen, but they're always willing to give you what happened. And it's a start. Uh, one hotel, i.e. one parking company, also can create low rates or high rates demand in an area. I do think that, I think companies can work together just like any other industry to some extent, especially when you're marketing. Um, I think if we all buy in to the new world or the new industry, the new way of the industry, but not forgetting the old ways, because I do believe that it's not 100, even in 15 years from now, I don't think it's going to be 100% people not driving around and driving into a garage and paying. Um, I don't think it'll ever go automated, at least not in our lifetime, but um, here. Uh, but I think there can be ways to work together, and it's the marketing. It's the realizing that if we can get you know, X, Y, Z amount more people into that area, we all benefit because eventually we all fill up. And so, uh, you know, Kurt and I have spoken and I've spoken with a number of people in this room. I believe it's a complete sociological change. I mean, if every garage, if you went to downtown San Francisco, every garage was filled by 8 o'clock, guess what you would be doing the night before? You'd be going online trying to figure out where you're going to park. It just because you have to park. You have to be there. So now everyone's showing up between 7.30 and 8.30. They can come later, but they have a guaranteed spot for whatever way the technology gets you there, by phone, by the computer, by the car, for that matter, um, having it. So, but that doesn't happen yet. Um, it does happen on the special events. It happens in valet parking. I've even seen it uh, for restaurants. But... Uh, until everyone need, has that need to do it, unless we show them what can be done, how we can change it. Uh, hotel down the street could be selling a $5 room right now. You don't know unless they tell you to call them and to book it during this specific time. Same idea with this. It has to work together. I, and by all means, I think the vendors are the ones that need to take the control and come up with a message, but I do think the operators can work together to some level, not giving up our secrets, but if we can get 5,000 more people into Oakland, 
or 10,000 more drivers specifically going where they need to go, then that benefits all the, the parking. And in all this... ties raises all boats. Yes. We all make more money. Yeah. And, you know, for cities, <laughs> that's not necessarily... You know, San Francisco, we all know how expensive San Francisco is uh, with their parking and their parking tax, but that increases their revenue as well. But smaller cities that do or don't have parking tax, it still makes everything more efficient. You have more people coming to your businesses, and that's where you're going to get the taxes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and... As we expand into different markets and new markets, we're for the first time expanding into trying to, you know, learn about new markets and go into new markets. And uh, those are the challenges, uh, how to get people to come to that area and, and use it efficiently. Yeah. So, Stephen Douglas, w w without cooperation among the industry, directories pop up that are created by outside organizations that you don't have part of. Um, what are your thoughts on collaborating in the interest of actually presenting better information, higher quality information, greater depth, uh, you know, to what degree are, do you think competitive pressure is okay? Yeah, from a, from a parking perspective, perspective, I believe that we, uh, there are certain aspects of our industry that we can work together on, certainly a number of spaces. I don't necessarily agree that uh, uh, a high tie raises all. When we, I, I don't think any of us will ever all be, always be full. There's, what, four parking spaces per car in the world so we're never all going to fill up. So, right. but, but what I do like about collaborating and combining d data is, is um, uh, in a certain region, a certain market, a certain block of a street, we're kind of all the same, right? Mm -hmm. we're all, we, we probably have pretty much the same equipment. We have pretty much the same rates. We're drawing from the same labor pool. So we're all the same. So what's the difference if we collaborate on number of spaces we have available and, and, and buy here? The difference is is... From a com competition uh, level, uh, I'm going to compete on service and not necessarily on rates and anything else because we're all the same. So I don't have a problem combining data because, frankly, it levels the playing field and it and allows me to sell something else, which is service. However, I have one problem with that being said, with that being said <laughs> here it comes. A lot of the data that I that I have, I have access to, and that I that my my staff and my equipment uh, complies or uh, uh, gets is not mine to give out because I manage these sites for cities and right. other uh, one site locations I don't own. Um, I, I have, I am a third party vendor like the equipment vendor is. And so I can't necessarily give out information and, and that brings in a whole new sort of variable that needs to be brought to the table is the building owners who own these large facilities uh, who have to also agree to, to, to give out their information. And for them, it's, it's, it's even more competition because they need that data for other reasons. So yeah. Yeah. That's, my, uh, that's my little concern there. So uh, looking at the, the, the technology side of this business, how, how do you think the technology industry needs to cooperate amongst itself? Right now we had, I think that slide I put up earlier showed quite a, a wide variety of companies that are sitting there in sort of vertical silos often. What, what? Are you asking me? Uh, sure. I was, I was actually going to go to the, oh. the technology industry, but if you've got some... Real, uh, real quick, yeah. well, I would like to see uh, a more complete package before it goes to market. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I find that so many uh, vendors are trying to get their item to market that it's not ready yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and more testing and, and different ways to test would, mm. would benefit... Uh, the vendor, the user. Right, right, if, right. if let's not put it out yet, let's make let's try every possible scenario and make sure that it works. Yeah, that's my. What are your thoughts, Rich? I think this is broken. Where's it left? Thanks, Eugene. Um, I, look, personally, I think it's about having a certain critical mass. So I think you don't have to have a hundred percent penetration. You don't have to have a hundred percent of the data. Um, where I may disagree somewhat with Stephen's perspective is that I think that valet, that valet guy will give you all of his data, and happily so, uh, if every single person in the city has their data online and no one's parking at his place anymore. So I think you, know, you reach a certain tipping point, and it's not 60, 80, 90 percent, you know, maybe it's 30, 40 percent, where you know, even if three folks get together, it could be on the operator, it doesn't matter where in the value chain, it could be three operators, it could be three technologists, it doesn't matter. Um, but I think you get a certain critical mass where people go, in this place, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and then everyone else just starts to fall. And I think that's the way it works in every industry. And I think the challenge is that that fragmentation, you know, which Kurt put up a, a picture before on, uh, that fragmentation has allowed us the luxury of being uh, inefficient. 
And I think really the answer is for a couple of folks to get you know get together on the technology side. It could be the revenue control guys. It could be the folks that are doing payments, uh, or it could be the cities, or it could be um, the operators. But I think you know you get a, a group of these folks together, uh, any part of that value chain, and I think then things start to change. Uh, and I don't think we have to start with 100% data as the goal, whatever that metric is. You kind of just start somewhere reasonable and right. in one place, and then I think things build from there. Eugene, how do you think people cooperate in the, within the, the different technology silos? They don't. Yeah. They okay. don't. That's a problem, yeah. right? right? That's why we can stay in business is because of that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a problem, but it's also a business opportunity. Um, I wanted to touch upon two things that you said. Uh, so Stephen mentioned, uh, well, it's the owner's data. It is absolutely right. It's, there's so many times we come to, to a technology operator and say, you know, you have this particular information we're interested in. You know, can we have it? And say, no, it's, it's not ours to give out. But I think if we were to go back to the owner and say, we can increase your revenue by 2.5%, whatever it is, if you give this, you know, they'll, they'll do it very, very quickly, I think. Um, two, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, we, I think you're, you, you, does this work? I yes. think you understand the parking value chain relatively well. You know, the, the, the real estate owners, the, <laughs> thanks. the, real estate owners the, the, the operators, and so on. What you also need to understand is the automotive value chain, and it's even more complicated because the smallest car manufacturer is many times bigger than the largest operator in the world, many times bigger. So that value chain is even more complicated. And what you need to understand is, okay, so, so you have the, let's say, the, the car manufacturers as well, the BMWs and so on. You normally have a, a tier, what they call a tier one or an integrator who supplies that. Then you have various supplies underneath. Now, when you buy a car, you don't care about the value chain. All you care about is that you bought a premium car, you spent $50,000, and they tell you it costs 5 bucks and it costs 25 right? And you're pissed off. You don't call Parkopedia. You don't call the Tier 1. You call BMW, right? And, 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 and so it's, 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 it's the end customers or the car manufacturer's um, reputation that's on the line here. And until we can get, or until the parking industry can kind of get it, act together in terms of working uh, closer and making sure that these type of services are accurate, and are usable and so on, it just means that some of the services which we want to have, which we think will benefit the parking industry, will just won't happen otherwise. Okay, so, so we think that having the real-time availability and pricing data will help uh, better, um, you know, having the decision, uh, having the answers to those decisions where they want to park and, and having, making the right decisions, right, in terms of what LA Express Park and Ansel Park wants to do. But until we can demonstrate that we can do this in more than just two cities, because let's be frank, if you can do this in two or three cities, it's just not interesting enough to a car manufacturer which sells everywhere. You know, they want these services. They want LA Express parks of these worlds in every city. If, they, if you know, that's what they really want. And, and so without collaboration, without closer collaboration with, between these partners, it's just difficult to deliver the level of service, the automotive level of service that they expect. And, and so, so, yeah, I think that if, um, if, if the parking industry in general agrees that, you know, having this type of functionality, having these type of services would be useful to their own business, they also need to realize that the, 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 the lack of infrastructure or, uh, in their own systems is, act, is acting as a break in terms of bringing the service inside the car because the car manufacturers look at the, look at the quality and say, this is not good enough. You know, we can't, we can't put our brand on this. So. Great. So, uh, Stephen Douglas, I, I, I love your disagreement. Um, I, I, want, I want to challenge it a little bit. Uh, I look at this and say, when we integrate traffic and navigation and parking together, do you think we can actually attract more people to a downtown area such that uh, maybe we do increase the net parking number of parkers? And that, that we do raise all boats a little bit? Or do you think it's not possible? Um, I, I think there's a certain point where it's not possible. I think that uh, I think there's an initial rise, and I think at, at a certain point it's not possible. I, uh, um, I, I don't think enough people, at least now, uh, go online before they depart to downtown on a regular right. Tuesday to see in advance where they're going to park their car. True, but if we actually make this very convenient, if we just say, you know, it used to be a pain in the neck to, to navigate the traffic, to figure out how to get there, and to find, then I have to start, start to find parking. Let's just go to the strip mall and get a, you know, a, a burrito, right? As opposed to going down to downtown San Francisco or downtown Oakland. Can we really look at this and say, well, we well, can make the city easier, therefore more people say, it's not so bad. You know, I quickly, I got the best navigation. It was not hard to find the place. I didn't even go to the restaurant. I went straight to parking and knew exactly the price I was going to pay, even though I didn't, didn't premeditate it. Uh, and I, if, if there was a traffic jam, I got diverted around it. Going to the San Francisco is not as much of a pain in the neck as it was once. Well, I think it depends on, your, on your, who you're trying to reach. If you're, are you trying to reach the... Uh Soccer mom who's going shopping for the day, then yeah, then yeah. then I then I'm quite certain that they would rather 
go to a mall where there's a free parking garage and they can just drive in and shop. Right. But I, I would suggest that a, a downtown uh, business district is you're getting the same people every day anyway with some variety of change based on, on what they need to do downtown. And mm-hmm. I'm just – for uh, let me just say it this way. For, for a special events – um, or um, a one-time reason to go downtown, yeah, yeah. I absolutely think uh, people would, would consider and do look to see with the traffic, to see the weather, to see what, where to park downtown, or they will. Right, right. Certainly, you could take the off-airport parking business, which I also uh, am involved with, too. Ten years ago, you could never have convinced me that people would make a reservation to park their car in advance. Now, 80% of my customers do. Right. But that's a certain clientele. I don't think that... Uh, uh, as a business person necessarily would go online. I've got a business meeting in downtown San Francisco. I don't think they'd go online in advance to look for parking. And I think that the, in parking, it's my humble opinion, that the majority of those people are going to park wherever the closest place to park to where they're going is. And if you're familiar at all with a city, which I, a lot of generations, but I think so, people know already where they're going and where they're going to park. Yeah, fair enough. Well, and, and I don't know if I can... I'll, I'll, I'll agree and disagree with you because I think. Are you my, are we married? Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> uh, because bottom line, it's still location, 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 location. If I'm going to a specific place, I, I can't change my itinerary. I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, a specific place in the city in the financial district. I have a couple choices. Then right now, it's about. Uh, you know, making that choice if, it, if it's less expensive um, or if it's easier for me to get to my final destination. I think the key here, and that's where, again, going back to the sociological idea, is you got to change them in the idea that that's the norm. The norm is to go book it online or on their car. That, And which company or which garage in the area, in the location I'm going to, Mm-hmm. has those, that service to come up. So it's partially service. Then Parkopedia comes you know, involved because they're the ones that are going to tell you where you can do these things in the car or the different services on your phone and you're looking ahead of time or on your computer. So it's a combination. I just don't think it's a quick fix. Uh, for example, I mean, I didn't think we would be selling uh, reservations for uh, the Chinese New Year's Parade. Mm-hmm. In Union Square, I, mean, I sold out the spots I put out on U- in Union Square, seven mm-hmm. blocks from the parade, and it was thirty-five bucks. It wasn't like it was ten dollars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and so I tried it, and and you know what was funny is the 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 best reaction I got in the company for it was uh, the attendance. Because we're blowing, you know, the employees, hey, this new stuff, and it's going to work great. And, yeah. You know, and they're like, yeah, whatever. Uh, have the guy come in and, you know. And now I'm bringing them, you know, 30, 30 reservations. So right. the proof was in the pudding. And then they want to see that, the, the continuation. Because I don't, I don't necessarily like the automation of Europe uh, and the way that is. I like the customer service. I think that's what sets us apart, I know. You guys are big on that as well, especially because of our histories, very similar family-owned businesses in the Bay Area. And so it just takes it to another level. Uh, It has more interaction. It has uh, more opportunity for the attendants to actually talk in those situations or makes it easier on a non-attended lot, bam, bam, in and out. And so bottom line, it's about saving time. But I I think Mm -hmm. it's it's a slow process of integration in the human, in the customer's aspect. We're talking about what we can do. It's how we can make the customers rethink the way they live their lives. How many people go on Amazon now on their phone and purchase something? Mm -hmm. How many things, you know, would you have done that three years ago, four years ago? I mean, I see people, I do it all the time. I'm in Sports Authority or something else, and I'm scanning to see what the price would be on Amazon. And now that I have to pay tax on Amazon, I'm like, okay, I can still wait. You know, it's the do I need it now mentality versus can I wait. But, you know, and then you throw revenue management and yielding into the pricing of, of parking and online, that completely, yeah. that's a whole different conference. All right, as, as we're moving toward the end, I want to open up for questions eventually, but a lightning round. Okay, what, <laughs> there it is. 
15 second answers prefer, 30 second answers tolerated. <laughs> what do you want to accomplish in the next 12 months in terms of smart parking? Who wants to start? It's a hard one, you should go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Collaboration between uh, providing the best customer service possible for our users and uh, an efficiency uh, for, uh, for, for the operators. Okay. Great, great, great. I have four seconds, so you can have those four <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Who else? We, uh, we want driver in every connected car to be able to easily find parking. Okay. Steven, what are your thoughts? Uh, I would like to increase revenue uh, with the technology, but still have a symbiosis of customer service and human interaction. Okay. And we want to see smart garages becoming the norm. An expectation, you know, in, in countries like Australia uh, and other places where we have a big install base, it's just the norm. You know, you don't expect to lose your car. You don't expect to pay the same rate for the front space as the back space. Like, this, it's kind of sensible, right? And people get annoyed when they don't have that. And that's really our objective, is to kind of hit a few big cities in the U.S., like L.A. and a few others, um, to start getting people frustrated when the folks that own those assets aren't making it a good experience. All right. Lightning strikes twice. Uh, another lightning round. What, in the next, uh, what, what is the one thing you guys want from each other? Let's, who, who wants to start there? What is the one thing you want from the other side of the fence of parker, parking operators versus technology and technology versus parking? Consistency. Good. A I'm more complete package to market. Okay. Uh, risk propensity. The willingness to try more. Uh, rather than say it's just been done this way forever. Right. Easily accessible data and services from the parking industry that we can bring in as a better service to the automotive industry. Okay. I just want free parking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot. It was, it was a trick question. It was a tr <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, we've got a few minutes left. We've got about 15 minutes left. I think it would be nice to open it up to the audience. There is our question. Bam. It seems like a lot of the focus on data is about finding the parking space, and then there's all these complaints about not integrating into a, a shared usable system. But it seems like the point of payment is a great driver for that. So for example, in the Bay Area, we now have the Clipper card, where basically every major transit type can be paid for with a single tap card. So that would be an easy first step if all meters were tapped. First, you get a single card. The city is a great driver for that. The city goes to meters with that, and then all of the garages want to get on board with that because it's so freaking easy. Um, if we have these sensors embedded in the concrete, why can't those have a readable chip in our license plate managed by the DMV that's auto? -play? You know, we're already recording license plates. I know privacy issues are, you know, going to be up. We're already recording license plates when you get a ticket. Why does it matter if it's recording your license plate when you're paying? Behavior. So, I mean, the, the, ease, the best form of customer service is convenience and speed, right? So mm -hmm. if you pull into a space and it's automatically paying and it keeps paying at whatever rate the garage told you when you drove in, and you can, or, or you know, if we're not even there, you can upload a uh, new time from your phone. I mean, why are we not making these jumps? It seems like the technology is already there. And then as far, Eugene, as far as, um, you know, systems in cars, why can't they be a single system? Why not go with choice there? Why not allow, you know, we already have fully uh, you know, usable computers in cars. Why not let each car user choose which software platform to Look, we, we all want world peace. We all want yeah. that. <laughs> but we, we, in, have a, we have a seat up here. In the real world, <laughs> like in, in the real world, in the real world, unfortunately, it's just not that easy. You know, if I could try and this guy, so why don't you just give me availability right now in every single lot? You know, it's, it's, you know, he needs to pay for this, right? He needs to justify it. And everything you said is right. I mean, you're absolutely right in that you're looking from the consumer perspective, and that's exactly the right point. I get, and, and what I think what you're saying is that this is where we want to get to, and unfortunately, it's just not that easy. But you're right in that this is where we want to get to, where it's actually easy from the driver's perspective. But unfortunately, yeah. It is going to require a lot of infrastructure investment and everything else. Just not cheap, and it's not fast either. I don't think anybody in our group has ever asked the question: Do you have one type of payment method or counting equipment? Reality is, is that yes, Caltrans will come in and replace every station with a consistent. Say we now accept the Clipper card, and they can spend 
they're just losing more than they used to, you know, and, and they can afford to do that. And these are real businesses that are running, and they, they're inheriting 30 and 20 and 10-year-old equipment and situations. And so the permutations just of payment technologies, you know, and counting technologies, it's just astronomical. These guys are managing how many different kind of, in, in, in 100 lots, you've got about 50 different, yeah, 50. 50, 50 different kinds of, of solutions. Well, that's what a city needs to drive it. Well, I'll, I'll just throw in. I well, it doesn't matter. These guys are making 1% yeah. and 2 and 3%. Where does that money come from? Right? right? If you're saying the city should pay for it, that's it. No. I, you're on the right track, and I've had this conversation off the cuff with someone, and uh, it, I think goes back to who was talking about the government and, and merging everything. Uh, it, it's it's still a ways away, but I drive the Bay Bridge every day. Do you know how many people don't have fast track? Yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> like, I, it frustrates me every day why there's only it, the other line should be you know empty, and everyone should be in the fast tracks well, and. Number? Right. Well, yeah, you'll get tickets, though, and back to your uh, license plate. So there's going to be plenty of people that won't give in and buy the fast track. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, question. Yeah, well, so just to follow up on that, um, I mean, things are things are changing, and we're gonna things are gonna look very different five or ten years from now. And so, for example, at SFO, you can use your fast track for your yep. paper parking, which mm -hmm. is fantastic, super convenient. Um, so, and you know, in some ways, we've kind of already gone in that direction. But um, as someone who uh, works for the government. Um, you know, I think my thought is that partly in this country, you know, we haven't managed parking. I mean, for various reasons that you guys have said, but we haven't really had an incentive to manage parking because we've overlooked it so much. You know, if there's four parking spaces or more for every car, we haven't really needed to do that. But that is changing, particularly in California, particularly in the Bay Area, where we're moving towards, um, where our, we're being required, or we, we need to accommodate our future jobs and housing growth in urban infill areas. So we need to use that land for people instead of cars. And so we're being forced to, which I think is a good thing, to better manage the parking resources that we have. And so no longer can we have silos where this particular use is, you know, this parking is only for this particular use and that. We need to look at um, how do we manage our parking resources so that you can use it across multiple uses um, so that we only need as much space really as we need for cars and can use the rest of that space for people and other kinds of activities. Um, so, so, that's, so that's kind of a comment. The question then is, um, especially for those who are working there, and I, and I wonder if you know this is part of the reason why Europe has gone towards more automation is because it's a more efficient use of their scarce resources, and that's where we're going to be going. And how long do you think it's going to be before I pull out my Google Maps on my phone, and as part of my you know reading on my Google Maps, it's also giving me all of my parking options as well as my transit options. How yeah. I think by all of that. It's, it's going there. So hold on, hold on. So let's get to a, a precise question um, of what you'd like them to ask. ask. And I'll re I'm going to repeat it so we get it on tape. Well, so two questions. So I guess it would be two questions. One is, um, do we see more automation and integration in Europe because of the need to manage what is a well, more scarce resource in terms of space for parking? Um, and let's, start, let's start there. Okay. What's driving European automation? Uh, urban, different urban planning. The European cities are a lot older. You know, um, the cities were built hundreds of years ago. So the only way to build stuff is to knock something down. There is no space. Okay, so so that's why you don't have a guy sitting in a booth collecting cash. I mean, it's unthinkable. You don't have the land for that. You know, so so what you end up doing is going underground or going above ground, multiple levels, and that means, of course, you control entrance and exit on that which means you have barriers, which means you have automation. That's why Europe is automated. Is it exactly, it's driven by urban planning. It's not that the parking industry say, we're going to be automated. The urban, uh, rather, the parking industry follow the urban restrictions in metropolitan areas. So that's why, whereas the U.S., especially here in Southwest and California, there's a lot more land. You don't have those pressures. Yes. If you go to New York, it's a bit more like Europe than it is like um, San Diego or L.A. Yeah. So I, I agree in part with Eugene. There's no question. But my experience uh, in Europe, was that when you distill that down, there's two impacts. One is the price of parking is just higher, right? right? So clearly, if you're paying two bucks, I and mean, just think of it as a piece of real estate, you know what I'm saying? It's like a house, and you can rent out that house. And the more you rent out the house, the more you're going to spend on the windows and the technology and whatever. So, you know, the house just takes in more rent in Europe. 
and Japan and places like that. And so they're more acutely attuned to that. And even labor costs are higher in most nearly all places. So you have this dual issue where it's costing you twice as much to run your house. You're taking in three times as much in rent. And so clearly you're going to be more focused on efficiency. Whereas if you go down to Dallas, it just ain't a problem, right? Like that's the reality. So I think that you have a different dynamic there, clearly. That's number one. Uh, and the second is you have to be honest about the decision-making process. You know, in Singapore, easy pass is accepted anywhere. That's because one dude makes the decision. You know what I'm saying? Like, he thought it was a good idea on Thursday. And so now that's what happens. That's true. And, you know, there, there's more people in the room, right? You know what I mean? And, and so there's just more people involved in that decision here. So I think we have to be fair about the construct politically that we uh, have to live within, you know, in the U.S. And we also have to be fair and say, look, you know, economics are going to drive this. Um, I'm on the other side of the fence where I feel like the numbers are so overwhelmingly in favor of using smart technologies that I could care less at this point who wins. Just somebody put this stuff in, right? Because if it's worth $25 billion and you know, like, like, what are we arguing about? So I think that there is an enormous way to go. But I think that a lot of it will have to be regionalized in the U.S., just given the sheer size of it. Uh, and I think a lot of that focus will be in places where revenue per space, whether it's in an airport or in a you know, city like San Fran, those are, the, those are going to be the early adopters, the people who go, you know, this is really painful. You know, I need to fix this. Right. Really quick on that. Yep. We, try, we actually looked at one of our garages to completely automate it, and it was cost effective. It was great. It saved on labor. It would have been more cars in an area. Uh, we brought it to the city, and they said, uh, 10 years, you'll be able to build it. And so by then, the technology would have been obsolete. So that's part of the bureaucracy and, and, and then some of the loopholes of, of just San Francisco. I'm sure it's easier in other places. But the demand is so high there, you would think, sure, green light it. No. OK. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to enter the, the lightning round for the audience. I'd like to keep the questions precise and down to 15 seconds or so, so we can keep moving. Um, how so, to integrate like uh, uh, car sharing and I would think electric charge stations and transportation, alternative means of transportation. We, I mean, we personally try to, in San Francisco, use city share as much as we can, zip car at, at as many locations as we can, and we now have charging stations at a couple of our. Uh, Well, most of the most of the auto manufacturers are investing somewhere in car sharing. Yeah, they recognize we need drivers, we need to preserve driving, we need cities to be car friendly. So we're going to need to have greater efficiency. So they're looking at those alternatives. I, I, I think. But we still anything that preserves cars, driving is right. good for the parking business. And we still have to senses, store the cars. Right? The cars have to sit somewhere for the for the public to get it. Well, nothing sudden in Muni or San Francisco or parking or transit. Will you, see, will you see them, like, including into your business? Like, you know, the cars are going to be there. That changes your so, answer. So, so that I think, yes. right, yes. Yeah. My, so, my answer now is yes. yes. That would absolutely affect negatively our, yes. our industry. So the question is, is, is Muni or, or efficient public transportation competitive with parking? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. And, Questions. And they, so, they can also be complementary, just to finish very quickly. So all the premium car manufacturers working on what they call intermodal routing. Now, it's probably not as popular, for example, in the States, but, but in Europe and other parts of the world where a car is just one leg of the journey. So a car will take a train station, train station will take it somewhere else, then you take a bike. You will be able to do that stuff from the car, the, from the planning to getting tickets, the whole thing. So that's already coming. That's already being built right now. Yeah. Chris, go ahead. Online. Chris, you got to... Uh, Uh, I just think it's the nature of the business. If you buy a shirt at Macy's and it has a hole in it, you're not going to call Van Heusen, you're going to Macy's. But with the technology, it might be easier to get in touch with. So I'm curious, would you, would you uh, prefer to maintain the customer service? Depends home? on the situation. Okay. I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, if we have a valet company at a hotel and they damage the car, they're not going to the valet company that was hired by the hotel. They're going to the GM of the hotel. Uh, I just think it's part of the business, and I think it's important to have that interaction of the customer and the, and the operator. I, the, the customer doesn't want to hear. 
that it was a vendor's issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question. I think that's relatively simple. In so my let's, mind, let's, let's repeat the question first. Um, the question was not what we can do for them, is what they can do for us. Uh, so, so, so it's clear what the parking industry can do for automotive industry. What can automotive automotive industry can do for for, for parking? And um, I think it. I, th I think what car guys can do is they can integrate these services and simplify the driving, the, the whole driving experience. We've touched upon this in terms of will. Um, how would that affect? And I think it will reduce the friction. Anything that will reduce the friction of owning a car, be it not having to deal with traffic, not having to deal with parking, is A, good for car companies, which B, is automatically good for parking companies. Because if everyone moves to New York and everyone moves to San Francisco of this world or Beijing of this world and everyone stops driving because it's such a pain in them, then, then it's bad for car guys and it's automatically bad, bad for this business as well. So what the car companies is trying to do is they're trying to reduce the friction of owning a car by reducing friction points like traffic and parking and so on. So if parking is integrated, if you know that your uh, current traffic condition is telling you are going to be arriving in 37 minutes and you know the availability, you can reserve that space, you know when you get there, you know, it's, it's all done for you, that's what car companies want to do. Not what they're going to do, that's what they want to do if parking industry can deliver. Because their systems are capable of doing that. We just can't deliver right now. Now I'll offer another point of view that, that it's you know, Streetline, we're trying to help people find parking that exists. We recognize, we believe that it's not a capacity problem. It's utilization, right? And that leads to that overcapacity because people are randomly finding, finding parking. So what can they do? Well, step one, they can start to integrate, create a much more robust technology platform in that car. Isn't it interesting that you can provide data to the, to parking data to them, and they say, but you can't access and put that parking data on the map in our current architecture of our car. Well, that's... You know, so it's got to be an open system, so you can actually say, well, gee, could we add navigation to it? Yes, you can. Can you add parking? No. You need to be able to do that. The second thing is, is to start to decouple the, the technology platform. That, an engine now is an appliance that lasts five to 7,000 hours. These are you know, 100, 200, 300,000 miles in, in their journey. All those systems are bulletproof, and that's why you see plastic covers over engines. You know, they're, just, they're appliances. But the technology is changing at such a rapid rate that you're going to need to be able to upgrade and say, I need to put a new, in, a new system into my car. You're not going to want to use 2013 solutions in 2017, but your car, your engine is going to be running strong. So, question. Uh, on the standardization issue, I think one of the things that there, it needs to be differentiated between is, are we talking standardization at the device level or at the application level? Oftentimes we see things pushed at the device level which don't come to par because it requires everybody to do the same thing. And I think we're losing the sight of the fact that we already have a standard. We have an open IPSQL web standard that everybody's using. Applications are popping up everywhere. It's just a question of moving data. Mm -hmm. and there, so I would, I would take an opposing point and say if you look at the integration point at the application level rather than the device level, there's already a path to a much greater advance than, than you could start talking about. Well, I think it's moving data, I agree. But I think it's also rendering data, making it consumable. Absolutely. But let's say, let's say in the automotive industry, for instance, a lot of the stuff are running Microsoft systems anyway. So why can't an application be loaded in the car to this lady's question earlier? Yeah. Why can't I do what I'm doing on my iPhone in the car? And if I can't do it in the car, I'm going to do it on my iPhone. I'm not going to do it in the car. And the iPhone becomes the integration point because the manufacturers don't want to integrate it into their panel. I mean, the fact of the matter is we're in a, you know, we're in a, a, a competitive environment where you know, users need to have open choice, and if from a vendor perspective you want to play, you need to find you know, the highest level of common ground that you possibly can. Do you work for parking equipment manufacturer? Yes. I, I guess. I mean, you sounded very simple. It's not. Well, believe me, I spent 10 years in the very early years of it. I know what it's like to drive a device standard and trying to get cities to buy it. Yeah. We've got three major cities and a bunch of others, but we also had competition. If we had more of an outreach at that point in time and, and done things at an application level, you would have seen this technology move forward much faster. Yeah, no, I, disagree, I don't disagree with you at that point. Yeah. Dan, you, I think you had a question. I saw you raise your... Oh, well, my question was just, what's the, what's the motivation for the auto industry to be building these proprietary, short-lived systems instead of just being a conduit for the smartphone. 
I mean, that's, that's what we were, that's where the conversation was going. Wouldn't that be much more marketable and much more, you know, the, the lasting system in your car instead I mean, of... Every, every car manufacturer takes a different perspective. The premium guys would want to own the user experience. They want to have everything embedded, everything integrated, nicely, tightly integrated. If you bring a phone, which a lot of the mass market guys, that's, that's the route they're going, to da going down to. Yes, that's exactly what they're doing in a number of different ways. But at least for premium guys, you know, they're, they want to own that experience. They won't allow anyone else to do that. They want the branding and everything else. And more importantly, it actually allows to create richer services, which does touch upon parking. If you bring a parking app on your phone, you have no way of interacting. That parking app will, won't be able to talk to the navigation system. You won't be able to find out the speed of the car. You won't be able to find out the, uh, their, their rival desti uh, destination or their rival time. So, so you can create that seamless experience, as I was re referring to before, where according to my navigation system and current traffic conditions, I'll be arriving 37 minutes. There is going to be low space availability. Therefore, I'm going to automatically reserve a space for you. When you have an app on that, you can do some of that stuff, but you can't do that tighter integration. But you're right in that the car, you have some of the car manufacturers going down the better route, and some of the car manufacturers are bringing in the connectivity and the content of the So it's not one or the other. It's going to be a mixture. It, I mean, if they can, it's all about owning the customer. I mean, let's be honest about it, right? I mean, that's what everyone wants to do. Everyone wants to be the platform that you can pay on. Everyone wants, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're BMW, you don't want to be wheels that happen to have an engine, right? You want to own that customer. You want them going on your platform and booking fuel at the same time they're booking a ticket and parking and traffic and all that good stuff. And you want to own them. And what you don't want is someone else owning that platform and sticking in their phone and making all of those beautiful annuities yeah. by creating value. Right? And so if you look at the smartest guys, I think, and you, you, you know, Eugene knows that world better than I do, certainly, but from all the vehicle manufacturers I've spoken to, um, the folks that are smartest obviously are gunning for, give us the data, we'll put it in an interesting GUI, you know, something that's digestible, and we'll kind of own that. Um, you know, we view our jobs as being, you know, adding, adding value on a per site basis, but I think if you look at an aggregate basis, um, the car guys want to, want to own that customer. They want to be software on wheels. They don't want to be an engine that can be around in 25 years. Yeah, yeah. And they use it as a differentiating point. You know, if my car can book yeah. me parking, if you can, you know, if you go into a dealership today and you can know there's a car that can guarantee you free parking, you're going to buy that car. Okay, now you're not going to get those cars, but if you can get to a level where you can, you can, you know, I think the younger generation doesn't go into dealership and say, oh, this car has 50 more horsepower, I'll therefore I'll buy that one. It's, can it play my iPod music? Can it find me part? You know, that's what kind of the car manufacturer is using now to differentiate themselves from other guys. Yeah. It's an infotainment piece. It's not necessarily, you know, the size of the engine. Yeah. Okay, is there a... Can I just sure, please. Because uh, it's a very interesting perspective. We've, I, I've... Uh, California Parking has spoken with some car manufacturers, and, it, and this was a while ago. But the one thing in this situation is, I can't speak for you, but I, I think you'd have a similar idea. That's where the, uh, the operators have a little tough uh, pill to swallow because we're talking about you look up on the GPS and you've got six different you know, uh, parking lots. And now I've got a competitor right next to me on the same thing. I'm working with Procopedia mm -hmm. or whatever the different software that it's there, but so is my competitor. Now, mm -hmm. how do I get, you know, specials right. and how do I get that person driving to come to ours? And that's where I think the information sometimes doesn't want to be given too yeah. freely because I know as soon as – uh, he hangs up the, with the phone with one operator. He's calling me. Never. And, and never. 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 I know. I'm the only one you call. If I may comment, I think the, the technology is, going to be, is at a point where you can micro-target how many of those offers that you actually put in. So you might put in five offers at $10. Right. Six, offer six is $6. It goes to merging, and I believe this is where this is going in with the whole technology world. So yep. It goes to merging yield management with, right. with real-time demand. Well, and I, and I agree with that. And, and I, I suggest that it's the parking operators that need to change oh, yeah. their viewpoint. Not, I, think the, I think it's the other way around. I think the consumer is ready for this. And I think as parking operators all got together and figured out it's not competitive, it's more a marketplace. It's the new virtual Agreed. marketplace. Then it works. So, and I'd just like to say one other thing. There is a group of people that are together. It's called the uh, Green Parking Council. I'm the chairman of the board, John Schmidt. And um, 
We are stakeholders that are real estate owners, parking operators, technology groups, and we're all open platform for collaboration because we're trying to figure out this whole thing. And the way we're doing it is open sourcing. We have a, uh, we're open source collaborative group that share strategic <coughs> strategies with each other and what works and what doesn't work. So it's, it, there is a group out there, a lot of people in this room, Professor Shoup, uh, Alexowski, uh, a lot of people in this room um, are parts of this. Uh, Park Assist is part of it, Eugene is part of it. Uh, and we're all together. Streetline actually has a lot of volunteers on our board. And uh, we've developed certifications for uh, green parking garages because uh, the uh, building council doesn't do that. The United States Green Building Council doesn't do that right now. So we actually certify garages. But we're also looking together as a group mm -hmm. to break down the walls of parking operators using uh, real estate people, using uh, big stakeholders. And not coincidentally, T. Mm -hmm. Russell Shields, who was one of the, the founding partners of IPS, is also on the advisory board of the Green Parking Council. So he sees what's happening. And one more point is NAVTEC. NAVTEC kind of solved that same proprietary thing. T. Russell Shields took NAVTEC and he took all these things and you now, it's you, your point about a smartphone integrating into the car, that's happening. I mean, yeah. everybody's going to accept it. In the beginning, the manufacturer's going to want to have their own people, their own things, but it's it's going to quickly migrate out. You, you just okay. can't stop it. It's going to hot you fuck up. Okay. So, um, I Thank you. Yeah, Green Parking Council is great. Um, I think uh, we've sort of, unless there's one last quick burning question, I think we sort of hit, hit our, our, our lunch period, but we're between you and lunch. So I want to thank Stephen and Stephen from the, from the parking industry, as well as Rich and Eugene. Thank you all. So we've got two co-sponsors for lunch. Uh, the first I'd like to bring up John Covray, the Vice President for Case Parking. Thank you. Again, my name is John Couvret. I'm with Case Parking. That was a great session. Thank you. Um, last, last day, yesterday, it was um, taking the transportation industry, excuse me, the parking industry, and introducing it to the transportation industry. And I think today is a little bit of the, the parking industry introducing itself to transportation. And as a guy who's traveled the country the last couple of years, um, crisscrossing between transportation and parking, there's great opportunities in this um, and, and what, what is happening in, in the industry as far as the collaboration between the operators and technology and the municipalities. Um, so uh, it's great. The guy last time was b b before you, before drinks, I'm before you, before lunch, and so they gave me two hours, right? Is that what it, what it was? Um, so what, what, you know, um, when, when I talk about transportation and I talk about parking, it, you're, you folks are at a, at a crossroads, and I'll get to what we do very quickly, but it just drives me to, to I think it was Molly from City of Boulder, you get the award for the best question of the conference. I have nothing to give you, but you get the best award, and that is, what is my ROI? If I'm going to go spend money on this, how, what, is, what is my actual return? And so I look at the transportation and the parking industry, and this notion of Internet of Things is going to start driving things. We talked about the in-vehicle navigation systems, but so there's mobility that's being, that's being touched here. Analytics. Um, last year at the National Parking Association, which used to be a very siloed organization, IBM was a keynote speaker on getting data um, out, out of the parking operations. And so you see the financial markets coming in as far as, um, um, you know, like you know, our friends over at QuickPay, as far as pay, paying online, and all, those, all the different me mechanisms from a financial standpoint. Social media, all right? And I go back to what Molly is, is asking, and, and as you see these different things pop up, where's the ROI? And the ROI is inherent in all of this. And the folks that think forward and combine parking and the transportation are the ones that are going to find the ROI to drive these things. Um, communications. Uh, we've partnered recently with Verizon. They are big on what's going on in the parking world. They've really embraced what we're trying to do out there. Um, the advertising segment. Some of the smartphone applications are driving merchant um, advertising. If you want to see ROI, the ROI becomes very simple when you start looking at all the different applications that can drive, um, drive this. And then we talked about, you talked about the owners and the real estate folks. They're also in this ecosystem that Kurt talked about. And so I don't really see it's parking versus transportation. I see it's parking and transportation. And so what do we do? We count cars really well. 
And, and so I took the time to talk about that because when you count cars, you know, they drive into a lot and then they, then they leave. And if you can count those cars very accurately, that data is of great value. And when we've talked to different um, industries, um, well, real quick slide, little slide thing. We take the counts off of, off of lots and we'll take it off of garages. We'll feed it to the cloud. We've got a dashboard application. That dashboard application um, <clears throat> um, is sitting in a database and it's extensible, it's shareable, um, and those that need it. Um, we're feeding into a street line, we're feeding into a park, me, we're feeding into a, a um, Parkopedia, all the different uh, places that actually need that data. So very quickly, we talked to four different markets. The first market we talked to is municipal parking. From the city of L.A. to the city of Newark, there's lost sales tax revenue. And having vehicle counts coming off your system, there's your, there's your ROI, there's your funding. And there's huge funding on that. City says city of L.A. says $75 million in lost sales tax revenue. That's coming out of the city controller for the, for the city of L.A. You see uh, reduced local traffic congestion. Uh, that 30 percent of people drive around looking for parking. Then they go out and hire the Kimley Horns and say, where's, what's, where's, what's fix, my, fix my parking problem? And they keep invariably, invariably saying there's plenty of parking. People just don't know where they're at. So it gets back to actually feeding the operators. We talked to commercial lots. Where we're dealing with an operator down in Southern California. He says if he can get one more car on his lot a day, he gets his ROI. All right? And so, there's, so how do you pay for all this? And it's really critical that all the data that's being created, and we don't want to necessarily be that aggregator of the data. We'll be the generator of the data and the sharing of that data. Um, report vehicle counts um, with, with confidence. From an audit standpoint, they say shrinkage happens. Um, another Kimley Horn quote was 10 to 40% of cash in, tr in parking disappears. So with your counts, I can now tell you how many cars have come in every single lane. Um, in the colleges, they've got 1,000 spaces. They've got this permit oversell ratio. They don't know how many, how many permits they can sell unless they know what their lot utilization is. Um, we're feeding into portals and also e e events. And um, uh, you know, if, a lot, if a business school needs 50 spaces in lot 72, uh, being able to so exactly what's going on in that, it's all in the data. We keep hearing it's all about the data. And the data is being generated, and, and so it's learning how to take advantage of that data to give you a return on investment on that data. And the last one, um, this was actually added to us, is hospitals. <clears throat> Obamacare is coming out, and, they're gonna be, and, and, and uh, hospitals are going to be measured on customer SAT. We're dealing with a hospital in Southern California. If they move customer SAT by 1%, it will drive millions of dollars in annual revenues back into their, into their coffers. And they get measured uh, customer satisfaction from when they arrive on the lot to when they're discharged. So what do we do? We count cars. So I had to have a whole bunch of fillers in between of count cars. <laughs> so we count cars, and we do it very well, and we work with many of the folks that are in the room here, both from the operators and the technology standpoint of counting cars. Thank you. Okay, so our final, um, our final um, sponsor spotlight is ITS California, Brian Burkhart. Now, um, for those of you who weren't here when we started on Monday, I reminded you to do one thing, and that is to join ITS America, join ITS California, and join the Green Parking uh, Council, because it's by participation in these organizations that you can make a difference. We need your help. Um, ITS California is probably the largest um, state chapter that we've got in the United States. We've got state chapters in over 40 states. It's a very active and a very progressive state chapter. So I want to thank Brian and uh, ITS California also for co-hosting the lunch. Josh, I'm not Brian. Uh, I'm Josh Peterman from Fair and Piers, but I'm representing ITS California today. Thank you for, all, uh, for, for coming. I'm starving, so this is going to be fast. <laughs> um, we've got, as Scott was saying, almost 100 member organizations, uh, public, private, uh, universities. Uh, we've got about 20 some odd board members. I've seen half a dozen here uh, today, Caltrans, MTC. Uh, TSRC here at Berkeley, as well as uh, MTA, Sandag, and a lot of folks uh, in Southern California. What do we do? We collect dues is one of the things we do. We have about $50,000 in the bank, and we need to spend it. So we're doing our first uh, scholarship uh, outreach this year. So we'll uh, give that to a few students, trying to bring them into the ITS field. Uh, we conduct legislative outreach um, on members of interest to the ITS community. So uh, we sent a uh, a letter to the California legislature um, trying to convince them to use cap and trade dollars for ITS, and we're organizi organizing <clears throat> organizing a legislative outreach event at the Capitol later this year. Um, we have an annual meeting at Flip Flop, Southern California, Northern California. This year's will be in Southern California in the fall. Stay tuned on that. We have workshops smaller than this. Um, in both Northern and Southern California, we had one last week on, on big data. Um, 
uh, which was actually really well attended, so that was exciting. Um, we host local uh, dignitaries for business breakfasts, which is a nice thing here in uh, Northern California. Um, yourselves with about eight to uh, eight to ten people per local dignitary. Randy Iwasaki was here yesterday. I don't see him today, but he's been one of our guests. Um, so that was the, I was trying to hit on three things, who we are, what we do, and why I become a member. Incidentally, we spent about five grand two years ago on a little video that I'm supposed to use for events just like this. We've never used it. For those of you that are board members, don't do that again. Um, <laughs> Uh, so why become a member uh, other than doing what Scott tells you to do, which is a good idea? Um, you get involved in interesting discussions like this, um, and outside on the table uh, are our registration levels. If you're a public agency and you register, you get free, you get a comp registration to our annual meeting, so that's a pretty good deal. And uh, you get a full year's um, membership for the basically the same cost as what you paid for this event, so it's a pretty good deal. So thank you very much.